Thank you for joining us on this holiday weekend. It's so good to see your faces. My name is Danny Bowl, and I'm the worship pastor here at Eagles View Church. If you're joining us online, hello. Thank you for joining us online. On July 16th, 1990, something very significant happened. The world will never be the same again. I was born. No, no, hold your applause. Hold your applause. I was born the seventh child in a family of eight kids. If you look up here, these are my, uh, this is my family. I'm the little guy down here on the uh, bottom left. And uh, there were eight kids in, in my family. And um, my parents named six kids before they named me. They were getting pretty good at it by, by then. They had a name on their minds. And they wanted to name me Jesse. And uh, they were about to bestow on me that name that I'd be called for the rest of my life when my 12-year-old older brother, Joseph, who is right there in the bottom left now, he felt this unquenchable fire burning within him. He just had to speak up. He said, Jesse, you're going to name him Jesse? Daniel was one of the most important people in the Bible. Daniel had influence. He had God's character and favor. You need to name him Daniel. And my parents sat for a second in silence, and my dad answered, his name is Daniel. Even as I grew up, I had a 12-year-old brother who was a mediator for me. Before I could even walk or talk or, or even think He mediated on behalf of of me and my life. And even as I I grew up, he he even gave me a job as his intern, as as the worship ministry intern at his church in Austin. I was his intern when I got called to EVC about 10 years ago. Do you have someone who's been an advocate for you in your life? Do you have a mediator? We, we've been in this series, Don't Waste Your Wilderness, and we followed the Israelites out of Egypt and walked with them during different difficult situations that they have traveled through, and God has stepped in in so many different ways and come through on their behalf. Now we come to the moment where they finally reached Mount Sinai. In chapter 20, God gives the Israelites the 10 words. We know them as the 10 commandments. They are the first installment of the Old Testament law. Moses comes down the mountain with instructions from Yahweh. And in chapter 20 of Exodus, it says this, then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon the children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Hey, Mike, we're ringing a little bit. You could just turn me down just a pinch. After Moses gives the Israelites the first of the 613 laws of the Torah, the Israelites say in one voice, yes, we agree to the terms of this covenant. We are so down. And then Moses says, okay, I'm going to BRB. I'm going to be right back. I'm going to grab some more laws and I'll bring them back to you soon. He goes, Moses goes back up the mountain Mount Sinai for about 40 days. And for 40 days, God is giving him instructions on how to build the tabernacle. This is the meeting place between God and his people. This is where God's glory would reside. God's primary goal in all of this was to have a way to be with them. While Moses was at the top of Mount Sinai receiving these new instructions, the Israelites were at the bottom of Mount Sinai with Aaron as their leader, as their interim leader, and they began to get restless and impatient. And this brings us 
to our primary passage for today, Exodus 32. Turn in your Bibles with me to Exodus 32. It says this, starting in verse 1. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said. Make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here out of the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold and melted it down and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to Yahweh. The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. So let's focus for just a second on the comments that were made in this passage. In verse 1, the Israelites say to Aaron, Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. The Israelites have no loyalty to Yahweh or to Moses. They are ready to move on. They have the attitude of, what have you done for me lately? They want new gods to lead them. They could care less about the constant miracles and protection and provision that God has offered them. They want new gods. They are idiots, right? But wait, do we do this? Do we forget the constant grace and provision that God has offered us? Do we find our safety and security in things and in people other than Yahweh? Then in verse 3, someone says to someone else, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So we're not told who said this or to whom, but they're now attributing Yahweh's miraculous deeds and protection to other gods. They are idiots, right? But wait, do we do this? Do we give credit for God's constant love, protection, and provision to things and people other than Yahweh? There's so much confusion happening in this passage. To me, it seems like fear is the dominant emotion of the Israelites. They were scared. Their desire for a physical representation of God wasn't just born out of nowhere. They had just spent 400 years in Egypt. There were idols everywhere. Imagine that, 400 years. In the U.S., we don't even have a a category for this type of of time period. The U.S. is only 246 years old. They were in Egypt for almost double that amount of time. Freedom was something that they had no categories for. Freedom always brings an element of danger. They were feeling it. Egypt was the first world superpower. It was an advanced civilization, a force to be reckoned with. It had great walls and huge Egyptian armies to keep them safe. Slavery was incredibly difficult, but there was still a sense of safety and security. They knew that at least the Egyptians wouldn't just allow their property to die. There was security in being in Egypt. Exodus 13, 18 tells us that the Israelites left Egypt equipped for battle. But here's the thing. They had never actually fought or had a battle before they left there. They had weapons, but no knowledge of how to use them. They fought the Amalekites and won, but only because God allowed them to through Moses' raised arms, like we learned about last week. They were like a newborn nation trying to figure out how to walk. And suddenly, they found themselves in the wilderness, vulnerable on every side, 
and completely unsure about how to survive on their own. And their leader is nowhere to be found. So in this new, daunting situation, without hearing from Moses or Yahweh for a few weeks, they, seemed, they, they did what seemed very logical to them. They made a mediator, a physical idol. They wanted something tangible. They wanted something they could see and touch to reassure them that they were safe and protected. The problem is that that thing that they built and they put their trust in would never have been able to save them in battle or provide for their needs. There was a false security in the golden calf. We are all guilty of idolatry. It's a part of who we are as humans. We find our worth and our identity in anything other than being a child of God. St. Augustine, one of the most influential church fathers in history wrote a lot about disordered love. He, he believed that our problem wasn't necessarily that we love the wrong things, it's that we love the right things in the wrong order. If you want to know what your idols are, what are you afraid of losing? What is the thing that if you lost it, you would lose your will to live? <clears throat> what do you have nightmares about? That's where you'll find your idol. Is it money or your career? Is it romantic love? Is it your kids or your spouse? In 2005, David Foster Wallace, an American novelist and a short story writer, gave a commencement speech at Kenyon College. I don't know much about David Foster Wallace. I haven't read any of his work, but I know he had some serious issues. But he's widely regarded as one of the most influential American authors of his generation. In 2008, he lost his battle with depression. But not long before that, he gave this commencement speech. And I think you can tell from this quote that he's probably not a believer. But I think he was onto something. He says this, <coughs> in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, being it, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the wicked mother goddess or the four noble truths, or some inviolable set of ethical principles is that pretty much anything else that you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap the real meaning of life, then you will never have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power, and you will end up feeling weak and afraid. You will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful. It's that they're unconscious. They are default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. It was three years later that David Foster Wallace hung himself in his apartment in Claremont, California. Now, I don't know what David Foster Wallace worshipped. But I think it's safe to say that it ate him alive. The thing about worshipping a created thing over the creator is that you will always be at risk of losing that thing. And one day you will inevitably lose it. And once you lose it, it will never be able to save you. Even good things 
that we love, noble things to love, your spouse or your kids. These are noble things to love. But if I make my spouse my idol, or if she makes me her idol, one day I may be looking up at her from a casket and I won't be able to save her. Finding our worth and our identity in anything other than God will eventually eat you alive. So then we have, we have Aaron, the interim leader, while Moses is gaining more revelation, and he leads in the creation of this idol. And then you can almost sense from him this strategy to assist them in the creation of the idol, but also trying to honor Yahweh. So verse 5 says, Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to Yahweh. Isn't it interesting that Aaron said that the festival was going to be to Yahweh? Aaron was trying to make the best of a very bad situation. He thinks to himself, okay, we can give this whole fiasco a positive spin. The calf is an idol to Yahweh. Excuse me, I have a, a tickle in my throat. There's a contrast here between the way that Aaron views the golden calf and the way that the people view it. The people were trying to make God, they were trying to make a new God because they felt vulnerable and defenseless. They broke the first and second commandments. Aaron was trying to make the best of a very bad situation. Aaron was saying, this golden calf is Yahweh. Moses had given them instructions to have festivals in the name of Yahweh. So Aaron says, let's have a festival to Yahweh and worship the golden calf in honor of Yahweh. He was probably thinking, we can have the best of both worlds. We can make everyone happy. Have you ever tried to do that? It doesn't turn out the way we hope it does most of the time. We know how that can turn out. Aaron broke the second commandment. Aaron was trying to worship Yahweh through the golden calf. This is misrepresenting God to the people, and it is a very dangerous game. We do this too. We point to things or to people, and we think that they are of God, and we, and we think we can worship God through these things. I think the fact that Aaron survived this event and wasn't killed later like most of the other Israelites or most of the other idol worshipers was because he had good intentions. I don't think he was malicious. He tried to focus the people's need for a physical representation of God into the worship of Yahweh, but he misunderstood God and his character, and then he led others to misrepresent God and his character. I started thinking about ways that we do this in our culture, where we point to something, maybe it's a movement, maybe it's a person, maybe an organization, and we believe that they are of God and we think we can worship God through these things. Thank you. So here are some ways that we do this. Church itself, serving in ministry, attending Bible studies, or participating in church. Thinking that showing up at church means that we met with God. Or thinking that attending church makes us a part of the family of God. That's very dangerous. And we now have a culture of celebrity pastors. We put these mortal men on pedestals and we give them all the power and we think that they're God himself. And then we're surprised when the power goes straight to their heads. The church should be a reflection of God. And we try as hard as we can to reveal more of who God is. But if we aren't careful, it can become a distortion of him. Especially when we claim to speak for him. Spiritual community is vital to the life of every believer. But don't get it mixed up. We are all broken people in desperate need of a true mediator. We do this misrepresentation of God through political parties. 
on either side. I actually see this more than any other idol in our, in our culture. Both prominent political parties care about different things that God cares about. But they also enact policies that, that are against God's heart. He cares about doing the right thing. He cares about having good morals. He cares about life, and he values every instance of life. But he also cares about the poor and vulnerable. He cares about the orphan, the widow, the poor, and the immigrant. Caring for the good of our communities and our country is noble and vital. Voting is very important. But if at any point we say, that other political party can't be a Christian because of the way they believe. We have set up a golden calf. We mistake Yahweh for a set of political beliefs. We try to fit him into our own political agenda. We have this golden idol that we put our trust in, and then to all of our friends on Facebook, we point to it and say, this is God. This is so harmful to the kingdom of God. In the last few elections, I've seen mega churches with pastors that I once respected bring political candidates into their church, and they have a night where they celebrate, and they even sing hymns about this person and their political agenda. People in my generation and those that are becoming adults are rejecting Yahweh because we are pointing to a golden calf and saying that it's him. They're looking at the golden calf and they're saying, if that's Yahweh, I don't want any part of it. They're not rejecting him. They're rejecting this golden calf that we are worshiping but they will never get to know who he truly is because they believe us when we claim that the golden calf is him. It's terrifying to me when I hear someone say, if Jesus were alive today, he would be a Democrat. Or if Jesus were alive today, he would be a Republican. Guys, Jesus is alive. And he doesn't fit into any of these ridiculous man-made boxes. As a believer that wants to follow in the way of Jesus, we must come to the point where we realize that this place and this country will never be the kingdom of God. And we are putting our faith and our trust and our identities in something that will never be able to save us, provide for us, or protect us. And thinking that it will is the very definition of idolatry. We also do this with money. This is another American idol. To most of us, money is just a source of security. But just like the Israelites, we trust in the false security of money. We neglect taking care of the poor and vulnerable in the name of retirement. We are so appalled by people in ancient times who sacrificed their children on the altar of these false gods. But look around. That's still happening today. We sacrifice our children on the altars of career and security. And we don't even realize that we've sacrificed them until they grow up and they resent us for not making them a priority over work. We fill our bank accounts and trust in our 401ks. This is idolatry. Another way that we do this is the law. The law was given by God as a way for us to be close to him. It was meant to be a really good thing, but the leaders of Israel used it to create power structures around it. They used it to oppress people. We do this too when we get legalistic. We misrepresent God by pointing to the law and calling it Yahweh. Jesus' life was filled with him going after people who the law had failed. People who couldn't go into God's temple because they didn't fit into the box of what the religious leaders thought they should fit into. He went after those people. 
He pursued them. He went to them. He was the perfect representation of Yahweh. When unpacking this passage, it's really helpful to understand the way that the ancient Near Eastern people, that's the regions of Babylon, Canaan, and Egypt, and Assyria, the way that those types of people viewed the little g gods of the day. They saw gods very differently than we see them today. We believe in one true God over everything, and that is the most common viewpoint in, in our modern day. These ancient people knew that this golden calf, that this idol, was just a piece of gold in the shape of a cow. But they believed there was a spiritual being behind this figure, and they worshipped the deity through the idol. Idols were the mediators between gods and humans. They are the go-between. They help two parties come together. The ancient people of the, Near East, of the Near East all believed in polytheism. Even the Israelites who loved God and obeyed him and believed he created everything, they were still polytheists. They still believed in these other gods. They loved Yahweh and served only him, but they still believed in all these other gods. The gods of the ancient Near Eastern cultures weren't seen as all good or all bad. They weren't viewed as all-knowing, all-present, or all-powerful. These gods were flawed. They had anger problems. They didn't care about morality. They lied, cheated, and stole, and backstabbed. They weren't better than humans morally. They were just much stronger and more powerful. They were more like Marvel characters. Do I have any Marvel fans out there? I am one. I got to always relate it, relate it to Marvel. Um, but they were specifically more like the anti-hero, okay? Like, kind of like Wolverine or Deadpool or Venom. The anti-hero might save the day, but only if it serves his own selfish purposes. These gods weren't benevolent. They only cared about you if you served their own selfish purposes. Every idol in the Old Testament was connected to one of these gods. They also believed that these gods were regional. They believed that each god was over a certain territorial region. And these gods didn't require monogamy. It was a very normal practice to offer sacrifices to the deity of the region that you lived in on a regular basis to gain his favor while you lived there. But then while you would travel through another region like Canaan or Egypt, you would stop by the local temple and offer a sacrifice to maybe Baal or Asherah or in Egypt, Ra or Osiris. You would offer a sacrifice to those deities in order to gain favor as you traveled through their territory. These gods weren't jealous. They couldn't care less about your loyalty. They only cared about what they could gain from you. It's very important to understand the mindset of the Israelites. This was all that they knew. A huge part of this story is Yahweh is breaking the categories of what a God does. Yahweh is still revealing his character to them. He is utterly different than any of those other gods. Yahweh is a jealous God. He demands monogamy. Just two chapters after this incident, God allows Moses to see and understand more of his character. And in Exodus 34, it says this. This is God's description of himself. He says, Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. The Israelites had zero categories for this type of deity. Yahweh is benevolent. He doesn't need anything from them. They actually have nothing of worth to offer him. He doesn't need their sacrifices. You can imagine how difficult this was for them to grasp. The sacrificial system laid out by Yahweh, isn't so that he can have something of theirs 
or so that they can fulfill some need that he has. But it's put in place so that he can be near to them. Yahweh is holy. His holiness is dangerous to sinful humans. God's holiness is a lot like our relationship to the sun. The sun is very good. It provides heat and light, and it makes plants grow on the earth that I, that I benefit from. The sun is very good. But I don't get to define my relationship to the sun. Let's just say I really like the sun. I'm a big sun fan. I want to get in my rocket ship. I'm going to go up on vacation. I want to go get a closer look. I want to go visit the sun. Am I going to get anywhere close to the sun? And, and, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to die, aren't I? Is that the sun's fault? No, it's not. My wife and I just celebrated our 10th anniversary. On my honeymoon, Casey and I went to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We drove 20 hours in the car, and we decided we wanted to just go straight to the beach to just relax for just a little bit before we headed to the place we were staying. And uh, when we got to the beach, Casey brought out the sunscreen, and she started putting it on. She said, you want any? And like an idiot, I said, nah, we're not going to be here that long. I want to get a good base tan. We were there for probably an hour, and the stupidity didn't even hit me till we made it back to the house. I had the worst sunburn of my life. I could barely move. For my entire honeymoon, I was in extreme pain, waking up in the middle of the night. It was miserable. See, even here on earth, I don't get to define my relationship to the sun. I won't ever make that mistake again. But this is the way God's holiness works. It's very good. We need it to survive. But there are so many stories of people who in the Old Testament, who walk into God's presence in a flippant manner or in an unworthy manner, and they drop dead. Not because God killed them, but because his holiness is dangerous to sinful humans. That's the whole point of the sacrificial system that was put in place by Yahweh. The sacrificial system of Yahweh allowed sinful humans to be close to him. It allowed sinful humans to be covered by the blood of lambs so that he could be near to them. That's what he wants more than anything else. He wants to be our father. He wants to take care of us. He wants to be near to us. Idols were seen as the mediators between gods and humans. One of the words for idol in Hebrew is the word salem. And God clearly states that he wants no images to be made or worshipped. Why do you think that is? Wouldn't it be a good thing for a God to have a mediator? Here's why. Salem is the Hebrew word used in Genesis 1 to describe how God made humans. On the first page of the Bible, he makes mankind in his own salem, or in his own image. Genesis 1 says, so God created human beings in his own salem. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. The reason God didn't want them to make stupid, powerless idols to worship is because he had already created an image of himself. It's you and me. Worshiping a piece of gold not only degrades and devalues Yahweh, but it degrades and devalues humans. The problem is that humans are really bad at reflecting the true salem of God or the true image of God. In Genesis 1, humans are supposed to partner with God. They're supposed to be the mediators between heaven and earth we're supposed to speak on his behalf to take care of god's good world and we know that in genesis 3 the humans chose to disobey god's instructions just like they did at the bottom of mount sinai 
and they forfeited that honor and responsibility. All humans are still made in the image of God, but very few will ever live up to that calling. And in order for us to live up to that calling, we need a mediator that makes that possible for us. While this golden calf fiasco is happening at the bottom of Mount Sinai, Moses is at the top of Mount Sinai with God receiving more instructions from him. So let's keep reading it in Exodus 32. It says this, The Lord told Moses, Quick, go down the mountain. Your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf. And they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. But Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. O Lord, he said, why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce anger. Change your mind about this terrible disaster you have threatened against your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven, and I will give them all of this land that I have promised to your descendants, and they will possess it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. There is so much to unpack here. First of all, this narrative seems really startling to us. God is hurt. He gave the first terms of a covenant, and the people all answered with one voice saying, yes, we agree. And not even 40 days later, they broke the first two laws that he gave them. This is the equivalent of a husband or a wife standing at the wedding altar and making vows to each other and then going out and cheating on the honeymoon. Yahweh is hurt. He wants to be near to them. He's performed multiple grand gestures of love for them so that he can be near to them. But within the course of a few weeks, they're ready to just move on to the next God. He says to Moses, your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt. My wife Casey does this to me all the time. She says, you want to know what your son did today? He took his diaper off and pooped on the back porch. That actually happened last week. And then, then Moses, he speaks back to God and he says, why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? Moses is like, uh-uh. I'm not going down for this. You're the reason we're in this mess. God is hurt. And he says, leave me alone. I'm going to kill them. This sounds like someone who is genuinely hurt. Have you ever said something like this when you've been hurt? Leave me alone. When in reality, that's the last thing that you really want. God tells Moses here that he's just going to start over with Moses' descendants. This moment is the most pivotal moment of Moses' life up until this point. He's constantly frustrated by the people God gave him to lead up until this point. Then Moses, for the first time, begins to become a true leader and a true shepherd. Moses has nothing to gain from interceding on behalf of the people. Yahweh tells him that he's just going to fulfill Abraham's covenant through Moses. Moses was going to be taken care of no matter what happened to the Israelites. 
Also, Moses might have been a little bit tempted here to go with what God said, what he offered. He might have been thinking, forget the children of Israel. The children of Moses has a nice ring to it. But no. He begins to step into his calling as a true image of God, as the true Salem. Not the mediator that the Israelites wanted, but the mediator that the Israelites needed. Moses starts to mediate on behalf of the people that he's been so frustrated with throughout this whole book of Exodus. He reminds God of two things. He says in verse 12, Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them from the face of the earth? Moses says, this is bad PR. What would the Egyptians think of you? And then the second reason he gives, the second reason Moses gives Yahweh, he says, remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven, and I will give them all of this land that I have promised to your descendants, and they will possess it forever. Moses wasn't saying, you can't break your covenant. God's covenant with Abraham could have been fulfilled through making Moses the new patriarch. Moses was a part of Abraham's family. But what Moses is saying here is remember who you are. Moses calls God back to being who he is. The God of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Aaron failed as a leader because he misunderstood who Yahweh was. Moses is a successful mediator because he knows God intimately. He reminds Yahweh of who he is and he calls him to act in a way that's consistent with his character. Then verse 14 says, So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. This is one of those passages in Scripture that makes even the brightest and the greatest scholars scratch their heads. Did God change his mind? Can God change his mind? The Hebrew word used here means to turn around and go a different direction or to relent. So changed his mind is actually a decent translation. Is he still breaking our categories of what a God does? Part of God's character is that he wants to partner with humans who bear his image. We see it on the first page of the Bible with Adam and Eve. We see it when Abraham intercedes and pleads on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. We see it when God partners with Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Samuel and David and Elijah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. The list goes on and on. He's constantly partnering with humans that bear his image. Not because he needs anything from us. We have nothing of value to offer him. Why does he do this? It's just who he is. He is sovereign over all things. But the way that he's chosen to order the universe is that he listens when we make requests. And our prayers and petitions can change things. Not by any merit of our own, but because we are his children. And he is the God of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. As good as Moses was, he was not a sufficient mediator for all of humanity. He failed in many ways. He made mistakes and he couldn't reconcile all of humanity back to God. But about 1,200 to 1,400 years after this event on Mount Sinai, God himself 
The same God who has this conversation with Moses steps into our world and becomes the perfect mediator. The mediator that Moses could never be. Jesus lived a completely idol-free, sinless life. The perfect, spotless lamb. And he died so that his blood could cover all of our mistakes and idol worship once and for all. His blood covered us in a perfect way that the blood of animals never could. It's permanent, once and for all. He paid the price for our sins for the same reason that the sacrificial system was put in place in the Old Testament. So that sinners could stand in the presence of a holy God. So that he could be near to us. If you are in Christ, you are free from the power of sin. And now we can be near to God only because of the blood of Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 says, I urge you first of all to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Romans 8, starting in verse 31, says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. I've always thought about this moment of Jesus pleading on my behalf. And I always, my mind just goes to a a courtroom setting. I'm the defendant. The accuser, the accuser is on this side and he's making accusations against me. And Jesus is my lawyer pleading on my behalf. And I've just always imagined this, this scene as Jesus' argument being something like, come on, Father. He didn't mean to do it. Give him another chance. I know he's kind of dumb and a little ugly, but he, he won't do it again. My genuine thought has always been, how long is he going to be able to keep this up? How long is Jesus going to be able to hold off judgment before God is just sick of dealing with a screw-up like me? I'm pretty messed up. I make mistakes every day. I'm guilty of idolatry. And I know Jesus is probably a really great lawyer, maybe even the best to ever live. But even the best lawyers can't do well when their defendant is clearly guilty and keeps messing up. But that's not what's happening here. Jesus stands before God in that courtroom. And he says, here's where they put the nails in my hand. Here's the nail marks in my feet. This is where they pierced my side. I took his sin on myself and was crucified. I've already paid his debt. He's covered by my blood, and it would be unjust to punish twice for the same offense. His guilt, his failures, his idolatries, every last one of them has already been accounted for on the cross. The ledger is balanced. The account 
is settled. So in order for you to be just, you have to let him go. Are you guilty of making your spouse or your kids your idol? The blood of Jesus covers that. Are you guilty of making your church your idol? The blood of Jesus covers that. Are you guilty of making a political party your idol? The blood of Jesus covers that. Are you guilty of making money or security your idol? The blood of Jesus covers that. Do you have faith that he's done that for you? Galatians 3.27 says that once we believe and have faith and are baptized, that we put on Christ like wearing a robe. That even though underneath the robe we're stained and blemished, when the Father looks at me and when he looks at you, he sees the goodness and the sinlessness and the righteousness of Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus of Nazareth, our one true mediator, and rest in him. You are free. Go and sin no more.